Sure, there'll be there, of course, uh, about the national anthem of the Kingdom of Prussia. So, of course, this week I'll be talking about continuing with the age of absolutism. We'll be, of course, talking about uh, Prussia and, of course, the rise of also Russia uh, as well. So, you know, welcome you back. Uh, I guess it's what, week three, summer semester, of course, BRCC. Hope everybody's having a great week. Uh, hope everybody had a great weekend um, also uh, as well. So, Anyway, um, kind of get started here. Uh, of course, I want to, of course, talk about some of our things we have. I think assignments wise, I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, and then, of course, I'll get to the main lecture uh, as well, of course, on the rise of Prussia. Uh, looks like right now, I know I've got a few students watching live. Uh, looks like Mackenzie's watching. Hey, good morning, Mackenzie, uh, Daisy, and also uh, Joy also watching uh, as well. Good morning, Corey. Uh, Monkeys, hey, what's up, uh, man? And then, of course, uh, Eloise and also Markella are also joining us as well on StreamYard right now. That we have, looks like we have Tiana right now. Uh, if you want to join me in StreamYard, of course, there's the link below uh, as well. So anyway, uh, I did want to talk about uh, assignments this week. Uh, we'll have, of course, a lot of different assignments I'm having due this week and, of course, next week uh, as well. I know we have the main things out right now. Uh, expiration quiz, I know uh, pretty much those probably do by the end of the week. Uh, Conquistadors quiz will probably be moved up uh, probably a couple days or whatever uh, if you can get that wrapped up. Uh, I know this week the main thing assignment-wise you'll have out, of course, is the first vocab assignment, key terms assignment. Uh, that's uh, due, I think, by Friday. So I'll start uploading that to canvas for me uh, to get that turned in uh, this pretty much this in week three. Uh, also, our first exam, I think is I'm going to post that this week, likely on Wednesday, uh, which is going to be like, a, I think I've mentioned this before, but it's going to be on the age of absolutism lectures. That includes the kind of two previous recorded ones I had uh, that I posted from last week. And then, uh, of course, I do have these two from this week, of course, uh, on the rise of Prussia and Russia. So that's pretty much all I'm going to do, of course. Uh, just have that section for the first exam. Uh, I think you, most of you only get one attempt on it, by the way, uh, which, uh, unless you get a bad grade on it. I'll kind of show you, the kind of look at the directions later, and I'll probably send an announcement about that tomorrow, of course, in the week, uh, to get more information about uh, y'all's first exam coming up. But uh, you do have, you can turn in study guides, of course, uh, for the first exam for uh, bonus points as well. All right, so uh, anyway, uh, I'm of course going to, like I said, we're going to talk today primarily about the rise of Prussia, uh, which I don't know if you ever heard of Prussia. Prussia was actually this German state uh, that was located in the northern part of Germany and eventually emerged over time, like between, I guess, the 18th and 19th century to eventually become, you know, the German Empire, uh, and then, you know, what we call now Germany, like Prussia is like the, I guess, the prototype state that later leads to now we call Germany. It's now called the Federal Republic of Germany, of course, today. Uh, but that's, we'll kind of talk about the background of it and how it kind of rises up. And, of course, I'll especially talk about the 18th century. Uh, Frederick the Great, uh, of course, the greatest ruler, really, of Prussia. That's kind of over my you know, right shoulder, you can see there. Uh, and so, yeah, we'll, we'll talk a lot about him today because he's one of the kind of is one of the major figures that really influences probably the most uh, overall. Uh, if you have any comments, questions during the live stream, you know, let me know. Uh, of course, or you can, you know, leave it later on my channel. Uh, if you got a question about the, you know, my class, you can email me. If you want to subscribe to my channel, you can also do below uh, as well. So anyway, uh, of course, I'm going to get, like I said, I'm going to talk about the background of Prussia. So today you can see there uh, Frederick the Great. Uh, that's a very famous painting of him uh, that was later done in the late 18th century. Uh, that's also his famous, one of his several palaces he built, uh, San Susi uh, Potsdam, which is kind of west of Berlin uh, today. But um, I'm going to talk about Prussia itself. Prussia was this uh, northern German state uh, that emerged kind of between the 17th and the 18th centuries. Uh, it's, it was ruled by, by the dynasty you may have heard of called the House of Hohenzollern. 
Hohenzollern dynasty. Uh, they also call it, you can see below, uh, some people do call it the House of Brandenburg or Brandenburg, Prussia. Uh, those are different names that they often dub it. And um, kind of talk about that a little bit today, like, you know, where uh, the name Prussia originated from. Uh, well, uh, the name Prussia goes back to like the Middle Ages. Uh, a long time ago, uh, they um, if you go back to like the, the like the Teutonic Knights and all these different knights that were in like Europe, like the Templars and all that. Uh, they've had these men that were called the Old Prussians, which were uh, medieval knights, uh, and so that's supposedly the origin of where you know one of the names of Prussia came from. Uh, the other theory is that uh, it was named after the Vikings, because uh, you know, in, I know in Russia they call the Vikings the Rus or Rus, uh, and so Prus or Prus, I guess, was like the kind of a variation of that, and so I think that's the origin of basically where the name came from. Uh, also, I did want to, uh, of course, I'll get to it more in later. The Kingdom of Prussia, you can see, lasted between the 18th. Uh, up to like the early 20th century. So 1701 uh, to 1918, uh, it was around, you can see, for a little over two centuries uh, as an actual state uh, with kings. And I think at the end, they, a lot of the kings of Prussia became also emperors, also called a Kaiser uh, as well. Uh, Prussia did exist up to Hitler's time. If you know about under the Third Reich, uh, Prussia was actually a state within Nazi Germany. So most people don't know that, but it's around to about 1945, and now Prussia doesn't exist anymore as an actual state, because uh, I think I think most of Prussia in the eastern part of it anyway uh, was absorbed by Poland and other states. So yeah, Brandenburg, Prussia. That's the that's the original name that they called. I'll kind of get into it a little later, but uh, it's actually two states, Brandenburg and Prussia, and it became one. And then over time, they just dropped the word Brandenburg. In Prussia for short, but Brandenburg, Prussia, I think was the original name uh, they call the state. I want to mention, of course, about also a castle that's very famous in Germany called Hohenzollern Castle. That's the origin of where the dynasty came from, like the actual name it came from the castle itself. And it's also, I think, a mountain called Mount Hohenzollern, where the castle was built on top of, which I think that's a rebuilt version. I think there's several castles that were there at one point that were called that. That's the origin of where the name uh, came from of the actual dynasty. But the dynasty itself dates back to like, I want to say almost like the late Middle Ages uh, as a whole. Uh, now, um, going back to uh, talking about uh, this state, you can kind of see like the territories of where, you know, Prussia or Brandenburg, Prussia was a long time ago. Most of the territories are kind of like in the northern part. Uh, of the Holy Roman Empire, and then also uh, the eastern part where Prussia is, or East Prussia, they call it sometimes, was like above Poland, like right where the Baltic Sea is, uh, right there. Uh, they think that Prussia itself emerged uh, really as a viable state after the Thirty Years' War ended, which is like around eight, uh, 1648. So they started to gain more independence because of the Peace of Westphalia, of course, which I think the French helped kind of establish, you know, uh, at the end of the Thirty Years' War. Uh, and uh, they do think that Brandenburg, Prussia, as they called it originally, was actually a, a, a type of state that really merged from really intermarriage uh, of the two states, like like rulers marrying each other, all that. And so um, that's how the two came to be together. So all that area you see in green that's in the northern part of Europe, like on the Baltic Sea, uh, that's the area that would originally be actually what would be Prussia later. And it's actually the Prussia part, East Prussia part, anyway, uh, was separate at one point from Brandenburg. They weren't even connected together uh, as a whole. They think they actually first start using, you can see 1618, they think that's the, the year where they first start using the name Brandenburg, Prussia, uh, but later on they drop it. You know, it's one of the things that happens. Uh, the two states, by the way, had nicknames uh, that they were called, or I guess official names. Uh, the, the Prussian state was called the Duchy of Prussia. So the ruler was called a duke, the Duke of Prussia, basically. 
Uh, and then uh, the, the Brandenburg state, which was in the northern part of the Holy Roman Empire, based around Berlin, uh, was called uh, either the Electorate of Brandenburg, or they had another name they called the Margravate of Brandenburg, uh, because some of the rulers in Brandenburg uh, were called a Margrave, uh, which was like a, a Holy Roman imp imperial title that they gave like generals or commanders uh, that protected the empire. They're called a Margrave. Oh, the Elector of Brandenburg was pretty important. Uh, it was one of several of these uh, prince electors that would elect the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, I think later it had 10, but I know at the time that was probably around seven. Uh, and so that's why the uh, the ruler of Brandenburg was was a pr pretty important ruler, like within the Holy Roman Empire anyway. Uh, they did have different capitals, which is true about that. Uh, can't really see, I guess, the one on 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 the for well, the one for Prussia, uh, but the one for, uh, the capital Brandenburg uh, is, of course, was Berlin. Uh, actually, it's now Potsdam, uh, the way Potsdam uh, is the capital Brandenburg, which is one of like um, I think sixteen states that are in the Federal Republic of Germany, whatever. Uh, capital of Germany itself is Berlin now. Uh, capital of Prussia, of course. Uh, is Königsberg, um, which that was the original capital they had, uh, which is kind of like on the Baltic Sea, uh, really right above Poland right now, but now it's called Kaliningrad, which Kaliningrad was a state that the Soviets established after World War II because most of East Prussia was actually taken over and Germany lost it after World War II. So I'm kind of, kind of giving you some background on, uh, you know, the Kingdom of Prussia. And you can see by the way another map showing actually where Prussia originated from uh, as a state uh, on the Baltic Sea right there. So you can see it's kind of situated between Holy Roman Empire of the West, uh, Kingdom of Poland below, and Lithuania, which is right next to it to the east uh, as well. Uh, people forget about it, but they have a city called Danzig you may have heard of. It's kind of around, I guess, still. No, they, I think it changed the name later, but uh, anyway, that was another major city they had, which I think was the largest city they had, of course, uh, in Prussia at the time. But you can see it was a very small state originally when it formed. Now, I'm going to get in next. I want to talk about, uh, of course, the background of some of the different rulers that were, of course, ruling over Prussia. Of course, one I'll talk a lot about first uh, is Frederick William, uh, known as the Great Elector. Uh, he was considered to be really the first major important leader that they really have uh, with the Prussian state. Uh, they call him the father of Prussia, which is true about that. Uh, and uh, I think he's really called the Great Elector because uh, he was a great leader, uh, also a great military mind uh, as well, because uh, really under him that Prussia starts to really develop its own military because uh, if you know about Prussia, it was known for its military traditions. A lot of a lot of Prussian soldiers uh, were hired as mercenaries uh, throughout Europe, and I think even some fought in like America and the American Revolution uh, and all that. And uh, a lot of the uh, Prussian uh, military, uh, like in the, the study about the nobility, uh, the nobility uh, of Germany were called Junkers. Uh, these were the landed nobility, uh, the gentry. Uh, that owned it, most of the arable, arable land uh, in the country. And a lot, of, a lot of them, of course, were the ones that, you know, pretty much were the officers in the actual military of the Prussian army. And a lot of them had this um, kind of a pronoun particle you may have heard of in their name, uh, which is called von, like von Richthofen, von Bismarck, and all these other, von Mulkey, uh, other famous generals you may have heard of in German German history. Uh, and um, it's also an indication of, like, noble pedigree. Uh, it's another thing, of course, you'll see. I think the Dutch have something similar, which is Van, V-A-N, of course, also uh, as well. Uh, but, yeah, he's the one that really starts to get, you know, Prussia on a footing to become a state later uh, over time, like a kingdom uh, itself. And so he wasn't a monarch, but eventually he's going to, you know, uh, basically create the prototype state that will become eventually uh, the Kingdom of Prussia uh, overall. Uh, kind of uh, I'll talk about the Kingdom of Prussia, by the way. Uh, it has a lot of different, um, of course, kings that were part of or monarchs 
uh, that were part of it. I'll kind of put it on the screen here, but yeah, Kingdom of Prussia again, uh, 1701 to 1918. Uh, after Frederick William's death, it becomes eventually a kingdom uh, by the early 18th century. They did have nine monarchs that were at one point rulers of the Prussian state or German state. Uh, the last three will be Kaisers, which, of course, is called also a German emperor. Uh, kind of some of the word Caesar, uh, if you know about that. But uh, Germany becomes an empire in 1871. Uh, it'll last till 1918. Eventually, it continues after that, really under, well, up to Hitler's time, really, it's around. Uh, but they call it different names, like the Weimar Republic and then Third Reich. I think they also use it that name as well. But no more, no, no more emperors or monarchs after pretty much not after World War One. Now I'll get into some of the different monarchs that were famous. The first uh, king of Prussia here, I kind of show him, is King Frederick the uh, First, who, by the way, I think had a nickname they sometimes called him, which was. Um, I think Frederick the Great called him the mercenary king is what he called him because he was really one of the first kings that starts to allow people to hire Prussian soldiers as mercenaries around the world uh, and all that, which is what Prussia is kind of known for, uh, all that. And uh, anyway, um, yeah, he was the first king. Uh, he was crowned on 1701, uh, January 18th. You can see, of course, the date in Königsberg, because that was originally the capital, I told you, of Prussia a long time ago. Uh, his real original name was uh, Frederick William. Uh, he was actually Frederick William's son, uh, who was uh, known as Frederick III, is what he was actually called. Uh, but he took up the name Frederick I because he was the first king that had that name. Uh, he was originally the Duke of Prussia and the Electorate of Brandenburg. Uh, but I think the title they used originally was King in Prussia because he was the Elector, electorate of, he was actually the elector of, you know, Brandenburg and all that, uh, but he was the king in Prussia to the east. So he had two different titles uh, he had that he went by. Uh, how did this happen? Uh, they believe it was because of really uh, the Holy Roman Empire under Leopold I. They actually recognized Prussia as an actual viable kingdom uh, in 1700 in this uh, treaty called the Crown Treaty. Uh, November 16th, 17th, I think was what was signed. And uh, if you know about what happened, it was all caused by the fact that King Charles II of Spain, remember that Habsburg, uh, who did not have any children. Remember the one that had the, that Habsburg jaw and all that. Uh, and they had, they had this war that was going to break out. The, the war of the Spanish Secession was getting ready to break out uh, between the Habsburgs and the Bourbons uh, in Europe. Uh, and so um, basically that's 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 the reason why Leopold he turned to Prussia for military aid. Hey, we need some of your troops to come help us uh, in this war. And so that's that's how that ended up happening. Uh, however, what happened, if you know about Charles II gave the throne to Philip of Anjou, remember that? Uh, Philip V, uh, who was the grandson of Louis XIV. And so Spain went bourbon. You know, they ended up losing the war, the Habsburgs, of course, and all that. But Prussia ended up you know, becoming a viable kingdom uh, because of that in the end. Uh, Prussia supported what is called the League of Augsburg, which later was called the Grand Alliance. That was the actual alliance that fought against Louis XIV in France and Spain uh, in the War of the Spanish Secession. And so that's kind of, you know, I guess Prussia's first entrance as a kingdom really in like a war and all that. Uh, let me move on. I'll kind of talk about, oh, there's, of course, an image he's showing the coronation, of course, of King Frederick I. And I guess that's the most famous thing he really did uh, as king overall is being crowned. He didn't really reign that long, though, just a few years. Now, I did want to talk about also, uh, besides uh, Frederick I, uh, who you see there on the left uh, in that image, I wanted to talk about Frederick William I, uh, who... Uh, some historians later call the soldier king uh, as well. Uh, he was the second Prussian king. King in Prussia, I think, was the official title uh, he was called. You can see he reigned pretty long time, 1713 uh, to 1740. Uh, he was the son of Frederick William. And um, 
as a, the second Prussian king, he was pretty absolute. In fact, they consider this particular monarch of Prussia to be really the most absolute uh, of the different Prussian kings. Uh, very militaristic, because I think under him, he starts to really expand uh, the, the Prussian military, uh, which I think peaked at one point a pretty large size. He's also very conservative, very staunch conservative. I think he had 14 children, too, by the way, uh, Frederick William. And uh, he treated his children kind of harshly. He was kind of like an authoritarian, if you read about him uh, and all that. And he is known for uh, expanding the uh, Prussian military by developing this draft system in the country that they call the Canton system, which was used uh, between the 18th up to about the, really the Napoleonic Wars, in the early 1800s. And basically how it worked was that Prussia would break up the entire state into like recruiting districts, uh, which was called a canton or a canton. Uh, and um, each canton would have to recruit like about the size of a regiment. It's about how large it was. And so uh, a lot of men were in the military. Uh, of course, in Prussia. If you know about Prussia, Prussia was, was, was this military state. If you know about it, it uh, had a lot of military traditions. I know under him, uh, by the time he died uh, in 1740, uh, their army reached to about the size of 80,000, which that's not that big, it seems like today. But uh, at the time, that was considered a pretty large army. In fact, it was considered the fourth largest army in Europe when he had formed it about that time. But you can see the actual population of Prussia as a state was only about 13th, to give you an idea. So a lot of men were actually in the military. And uh, there used to be an old saying about Prussia that you may have heard of before, which I've mentioned before previously, but they're not sure the author that actually, you know, invented the actual quote. But the famous quote is, Prussia is not a state that possesses an army but an army that possesses a state. So it's a form of Prussian militarism, which is something that's kind of around like up to the 20th century. And it's something they're kind of known for. So very militaristic, uh, very disciplined soul. That was one thing about German soldiers. They were very disciplined uh, type soldiers. Uh, and uh, of course, they're famous for a lot of different Prussian officers you may have heard about. Frederick von Steuben, who later came over to America helped out the American Revolution under George Washington troops, actually trained George Washington's forces on the Continental Army. Uh, Gebhard von Blücher, he's a, the famous German general that beat uh, Napoleon uh, at the Battle of Waterloo uh, with the Duke of Wellington. Uh, Karl von Clausewitz, you probably heard of him. He's a very famous German general strategist uh, who uh, wrote a book called On War. It's well known. Uh, Helmut von Moltke, the elder, he's a very important general, too. Uh, probably the best general, really, uh, the Germans had in the late 19th century, uh, especially like during the Franco-Prussian War. Paul von Hindenburg, you've heard of him. And Eric, Eric von Luden, Eric Ludendorff, those, those are famous generals in World War I. Also, uh, Eric von ha Falkenhayn was another famous German general in World War I uh, as well. Oh, another thing about him was kind of strange story about this, but um, supposedly uh, Frederick William I had this special uh, regiment that he made or built up. It was called the Potsdam Giants, or I think another nickname they called it was the Longfellows. And it was a special uh, infantry regiment of taller than average soldiers. I think the average height had to be like six foot two. Uh, I think that's my height, uh, basically, but uh, you had to basically, that was the minimum. And I think back then, the average height of most men was like maybe five foot six uh, at the time. Uh, and so they would actually try to recruit soldiers uh, from all over Europe that were really tall. And I think there was one guy I know that was like supposedly seven foot one or something like that, that they recruited uh, and all that. Uh, and so... Um, it's kind of something strange. It's kind of like an imperial guard, you know, and all that. And I think Napoleon had the same thing, too, where he had, you know, these imperial guards that were really tall, big men, that kind of thing. And suppose that's why, why Napoleon was kind of considered short, 
because they would see these big men with him. They think he's kind of short, but he's average height. And that and the British kind of propaganda about him being short also as well. Now, he had, of course, a very famous son. If you probably, I'm sure you've heard of him, which is Frederick the Great, also known as Frederick II. Uh, that was the main son, of course, and heir to the Prussian throne. Like I said, one of 14 children uh, that Frederick William I, of course, uh, had. Um, they didn't get along very well. You know the story about Frederick the Great uh, and his father. Uh, he was treated real badly, harshly by his father, uh, who I guess wanted him to be like a great military mind or officer uh, and also a leader, you know, leader of Prussia uh, and all that. And um, I think uh, Frederick was more interested in like art and culture. If you know about Frederick the Great, he was big into the Enlightenment, the Age of Enlightenment and all that. He even liked to play the flute. Uh, and um, there's a story about um, this incident that happened uh, right before he became king. Uh, in 1730, it's called the uh, Von Kata Affair. That's kind of well known. Uh, and uh, there's, of course, if you heard about the story about Frank the Great, there's speculation that he may have been gay, he, like men. Uh, and um, anyway, they had this officer in the Prussian military, Hans Von Kata. Um, suppose they may have had some kind of relationship. I don't know, it may have been a love affair. They're not really sure about it, but they decided to run away like leave Prussia. I think they were going to go to England or some foreign country and escape his father. Uh, but his father captured, caught him before they could leave. Uh, and uh, he imprisoned his own son and took his friend and ex actually had him executed. Uh, based. In fact, he had to watch his friend get his head cut off uh, and all that. He even court-martialed his own son, and he was going to execute him as well. Uh, but the monarchs of Europe intervened, uh, including the Holy Roman Emperor, I think at the time, Emperor Charles VI intervened and stopped him. Uh, but uh, Frederick the Great, who uh, Germans later called Old Fritz, uh, was really considered to be the greatest monarch that really Prussia had overall. He's also the longest reigning, uh, reigning close to almost like around 46 years. So 1740 uh, to 86, uh, he really, uh, you know, tries to make Prussia into this world power. Uh, he also tried, I guess the big thing he did too, he, he was able to connect all the Prussian lands into one viable connected state, uh, which will kind of expand over time into a larger German state uh, as well. Uh, he was known for his reforms. He was an enlightened despot, like probably one of the most famous enlightened despots really in Europe. Uh, he preferred the title, by the way, which was first servant of the state. Uh, he didn't really like this idea uh, that, you know, remember Louis XIV, I am the state and that kind of deal. Uh, he really viewed himself uh, as this ruler that was there for the people and not, not the other way around. Like here's the quote he said originally. He said, a king is the first servant and first magistrate of the state. It was something he kind of mentioned. Uh, and so that's something that he's, you know, well known for doing. Uh, also, he was all, like I said, he connected all the Prussian lands. And then, uh, of course, the other thing he did too uh, was he was really one of the first to uh, adopt the title King King of Prussia, because prior to that, you know, rulers uh, were known really as King in Prussia. So he starts to use that title uh, pretty much uh, as, as a ruler. Uh, I'll kind of go through all the different reforms uh, that he's kind of known for, of course, Fred the Great. Uh, I've got a few here I kind of mentioned about. Yeah, he did give a lot of religious, like, freedom to, like, you know, in, in Prussia, most people were, like, Protestant, like Lutheran or Calvin, mostly Lutheran. Uh, and so, like, Catholics, Jews, uh, they they start to get religious rights uh, as well. Like, Jews are start to be emancipated between, like, the 18th uh, and the 19th centuries, uh, as a whole. You can see they abolished serfdom, abolished torture. Those are things that he did. Uh, that's kind of famous, which very similar to what Emperor Joe II was doing, like in later Austria-Hungary and all that. Uh, so that's something he's kind of known for, of course, Frank the Great. Uh, he had his own civil law code system, which is something that uh, he started to kind of develop during his reign. It wasn't finished until after his death uh, in the 1790s, but they had a civil law code 
uh, that was called the Frederican Code that was based a lot on the Justinian Code that went back to the Byzantine Empire. Uh, but these codes are going to be important later. You'll start seeing a lot of these law codes being developed in the 18th century. It, it's the basis of the Napoleonic Code uh, that Napoleon develops, of course, uh, in France. Uh, also, uh, yeah, uh, education reforms. That's another thing that, 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 that really they started to do in Germany uh, as well. So compulsory education, that's some um, you start to see uh, with both sexes, you know, men and women, all that being educated. Uh, they even had different kinds of schools that the Germans are known for later, like the real school you may have heard of, uh, which is a type of secondary education that they have. And then you have also the college prep schools or gymnasiums or something that they also develop as well. Uh, not at this time, but like if you hear about the term kindergarten, like that grade uh, being, of course, used. Uh, later in the 19th century, the Germans developed kindergarten, which is like a grade before first grade, something the Germans developed, and they use it all, of course, in the West later as well. Uh, another thing about uh, him that's, of course, well-known, I'll kind of get into, Frederick the Great uh, was also a military genius. People, you know, forget about that aspect of him, but uh, he is kind of considered to be like an early Napoleon. I think it was a story where uh, during the Napoleonic Wars, when Napoleon uh, took Prussia during the war, defeated them, uh, he was standing over uh, Frederick, Frederick the Great's grave and said, if that man had wasn't around, I wouldn't be here. Like, if he hadn't existed, I wouldn't exist, you know, as an actual ruler and general uh, later. Uh, and so um, that's something that, you know, Frederick the Great influenced, you know. I will mention something that he's real famous for, I'll kind of talk about. But you can see this map here. Uh, you can see that he starts to connect the lands of Prussia. They are, you know, East Prussia with, you know, Brandenburg are going to be connected together of all that. Uh, he'll also start pushing southward, like into Silesia, also into Saxony, uh, which is kind of south of Brandenburg. Uh, he'll start to take that land as well and kind of combine that into a viable uh, German state. Uh, so that's something he does do that's kind of important, because before that, before him, a lot of the Prussian state was kind of disconnected and not really one viable state. I'll get more into this uh, in a second. Let me first talk about something that he's kind of known for. He is, now, like I said, a military leader. He fought in a lot of different wars, uh, like the Silesian Wars or the War of the Austrian Secession. Uh, also, uh, the Seven Years' War later as well, uh, like the Battle of Luthen. Uh, they consider that to be really, really one of his best uh, battles he really fought in. Uh, if you know about Frederick the Great, uh, he popularized what they call the oblique order. Uh, it was a type of military attack or tactic used by uh, enemies or armies uh, pretty much in Europe and afterwards. I think in America we use it too as well. It was a type of military flank attack that uh, they think originated all the way back to the ancient Greeks uh, in the 4th century. The Battle of Leuctra, I think in 371, uh, where... Uh, the city of Thebes, city state of Thebes, defeated Sparta. Uh, they used this flank attack on their left flank. Uh, and so apparently, um, Frederick the Great had studied the Greeks, and so he kind of pop popularized this whole flank attack. And uh, this battle, uh, right, you're looking at right here, is the Battle of Luthen, uh, where a smaller Prussian army uh, defeated a larger Austrian army. Uh, during the Seven Years' War. Uh, and he did it by uh, how these flank attacks work was that you basically would put forces on one flank, like your right flank, and attack their left. And uh, you would try to quickly attack it uh, before they could you know, get reinforcements uh, there to stop it. And then they would roll up your flank and destroy your army, uh, basically from right to left. Uh, and so that's that's basically how, how like flank attacks work like that. They use that later in a lot of wars, not just in Europe, but I think even in the American Civil War, they used it uh, at one, one, one point. Um, so, yeah, I'll kind of talk about that. Also, I want to talk about another thing that's kind of uh, famous uh, as well. Um, uh, if you study about um, 
the deal between um, 1740, uh, if you study about that year, that was the year that, that Frederick the Great came to power. It was also the year that Maria Teresa, of course, uh, ruler, of course, uh, Austria also came to power as well. The Habsburgs, of uh, course, Habsburg monarchy. Uh, and um, really his greatest success was really against her. Uh, if you know the story about it, uh, that if you go back to, I think I want to say the 1730s, uh, Frank the Great had originally wanted to marry her, Maria Teresa. I think it, there's been talk about that, uh, about him wanting to marry her and combine the two states or whatever. Uh, she, of course, did not like him. Totally hated him. Uh, I think she once said that he was that evil man or something like that, is what she, what she called him. And uh, what happened was in 1740, um, he reneged on that, um, that 1713. If you remember correctly, we had talked before about the pragmatic sanction. Uh, I think his father had backed it and he reneged on it. And so he decided to invade Silesia, uh, which you go to this map here, the Silesian Wars uh, were part of a whole entire war uh, that was later called the War of the Austrian Secession, which happened between 1740 uh, to 1748. And Prussia was backed by France at the time, and Austria was backed by Britain to kind of give you an idea of the alliances uh, that were in Europe. But if you go to this uh, map here, you can see that Silesia was that area in red on the bottom right. Uh, that's important. Silesia is a territory that uh, Germany uses later uh, to build up its industries, you know, technology, uh, war machine, because it was rich in natural resources. Uh, here's some of the things that it had that's important, but coal, a lot of coal there, copper, iron, ore, zinc, those kind of things are natural resources. Uh, and um, I think most of it's now in Poland now because they lost it after World War II, but I do know that up to World War II, it was an important area, uh, you know, for like the economy of Germany uh, in their war machine. Uh, the only thing about that conflict between all, they became enemies afterwards. And if you know what occurred later, uh, it led to the so-called diplomatic revolution because before that, Austria and Prussia had been aligned. They were, they were, they were actually allies uh, before this, but apparently the, the, because of this whole deal between uh, Maria Teresa and her, you get this switching of the alliances that eventually happen. There's kind of an image of, of course, Frederick on the left and, of course, her on the right. She would actually try to get it back, by the way, during the Seven Years' War, but failed, uh, by the way. Uh, and But um, you get this switching of the alliances, of course, uh, during the Seven Years' War. I'll get to that later in another lecture, but Seven Years' War was between 1756 to 63. And uh, you get this deal where Austria switches to France. So those two get aligned together. That's why you know, Marie Antoinette ends up in France, you know, if you know that later. And in Britain, our allies with the Prussians, uh, with Hanover, uh, which makes sense because Hanover, which was the dynasty that took over, you know, Britain later, basically German. So all those German states kind of you know, align with England, et cetera. And so that's the alliances you got there. And then you got Russia also aligning with Austria and France. So all that's going to be pivotal later because that's going to later lead to, you know, the, you know, the seven years war, which is one of several of these world wars that break out uh, between the European powers, you know, going back to the 18th up to like the 19th and even 20th centuries. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get to that later. Uh, I'll kind of talk more about you know Frederick the Great uh, and all that. Uh, but kind of kind of going back up to to talk about Frederick the Great. Uh, Frederick the Great, by the way, he didn't have any children. That's kind of the only thing about uh, his reign. He did have a wife. If you forget about that, uh, Elizabeth of Brunswick or Elizabeth Christine of Brunswick. It's actually his wife uh, that he married. Uh, I think he married her in the 1730s, 36, I think was the year. Yeah, that was the year he married her, uh, 1736. He hated his wife. Uh, his, in fact, his father had made him marry uh, this woman. Uh, in fact, he had wanted to marry Maria Teresa uh, in Austria, of course. 
Um, but he didn't, they, they didn't really live together much. They kind of lived separate and never had any children or anything like that. And I told you that reportedly Frederick the Great was gay. Uh, he preferred men uh, instead. Uh, and so that's that's something that he's you know kind of known for uh, overall. Uh, I'll kind of show you, uh, kind of go back to this painting uh, that's well known, I'm trying to find the actual painting of it. I think it's right uh, here, of course. There's uh, Frederick the Great's painting in the middle there, of course. I think I've got different pictures showing, uh, of course, Frederick the Great uh, overall. Uh, but that's a very famous painting uh, later done in the 1780s uh, by this German artist named Anton Graf. Uh, that's really considered the most famous painting uh, that was really ever done of really Frederick the Great. And a lot of people start calling him Old Fritz, you know, in his later later years which was really more of a terms of endearment is what it really was. Uh, and um, believe it or not, that painting was actually popular with Adolf Hitler. Hitler, I think Hitler's favorite leader of Germany uh, before him was Frederick the Great. Kind of idolized him. I think when Hitler was in his bunker at the end of World War II in Germany, that's the painting he had on the wall uh, and all that. Uh, of course, he is known for his palaces that he built. Uh, he had this famous su summer palace he built, which is Sans Souci, uh, that he built at Potsdam. This was something he constructed uh, in, in <clears throat> this looks like it was completed in 1747. It's a Rococo style type palace, uh, and it's also where he's buried today. Of course, it's a kind of also called Sans Souci Park uh, as well. I've got other pictures of it right here of San Susi. That was actually like, like to hang out, by the way, with mostly of men. They would kind of just hang out there. Uh, and um, here's some other paintings of San Susi as well. Also, there's another uh, famous uh, palace he built also later. There's the grave of Fred the Great, uh, which is also there at San Susi as well, San Susi Park. Uh, and um, Suppose he's got a bunch of um, dogs that are actually buried with him, not his wife. <laughs> and you'll notice the potatoes on his grave. Uh, there's a theory they always talk about that Frederick the Great was the one that helped spread potatoes to Prussia uh, in the 18th century, which is debated. But I think he may have popularized the use of potatoes uh, by the peasants and farmers. Yeah, there's another palace he's got called the New Palace, which was built later uh, after the Seven, Seven Years' War. Also in the same area, San Susi Park uh, as well. It's a lot larger palace compared to the other one, of course, you were looking at uh, right there. So they got numerous palaces that, of course, that were built, of course, by um, the Hohenzollern dynasty. Yeah, there's a better picture, of course, of the painting uh, of course, by Anton Graf uh, that we talked about uh, recently. So that's the point. The, they think that's the most accurate image, they think, really, of, of Frederick the Great. Right, I'm going to move on. I want to talk about uh, some of the later rulers. i got a few minutes I'll kind of go into and talk about later rulers uh, that were there uh, as well. If we go to the ruler on the left, uh, which is uh, King Frederick William II, uh, that that come that comes in, uh, he was the nephew of Frederick the Great. Like I told you, Frederick didn't have any children, uh, so the throne went to his nephew, uh, who would reign from 1786 to 1797. Um, he's known for being the ruler uh, that, if you know about this, constructed this famous Brandenburg Gate. It's like one of the main entrances, of course, to Berlin, a uh, big tourist attraction, of course, to go see. It's also where uh, the Berlin Wall kind of separated West Berlin from East Berlin. In fact, the Brandenburg Gate was on the East Berlin side, if you know about the Soviet side uh, in, in Berlin. Uh, and um, so that's something he's kind of known for uh, establishing. Uh, so he's, he's well known. Uh, the one on the right, uh, the next king is uh, Frederick William III. He always Frederick Williams. Uh, he reigned from 1797 to 1840. I think he's the second longest reigning ruler overall. Uh, he was a son of Frederick William II. Uh, he's important because he was the main ruler uh, during when Napoleon was conquering Europe. So he had to fight off Napoleon, which 
They didn't do so well against Napoleon originally uh, in the early 1800s. But uh, he's important later because um, Frederick William III is really the, the, the monarch that helps to restore Europe after Napoleon's exile. He's, he's involved like in the Congress of Vienna, 1814, 1815, and things like that uh, as well. Uh, also, uh, another famous ruler, another king, of course, of Prussia that's well known, uh, which is, of course, is um, Frederick William IV. He was the son of Frederick William III. Uh, it's really under him that Prussia starts to convert uh, to having a constitutional monarchy. They'll even have like a prime minister or chancellor uh, that'll run the state uh, eventually by the, I think by the 1860s. They start to use prime ministers uh, as well. And part of why um, Prussia went to a constitutional monarchy was because of the revolutions of 1848, uh, where the people demanded more political rights and the you know, right to vote and things like that. And so they realized that if they they didn't if they kept you know having an absolute monarchy they would have probably been overthrown, uh, that kind of deal. So that's why they did that. Uh, then of course the other thing that happened, of course, then later the you know if you know about Germany they went to having emperors uh, over time. You get the rise of the German Empire, which happened in the late 19th century. Uh, the German Empire. Last from 1871 to 1918, the end of World War One, and they, yeah, they had three German emperors, which uh, the Germans called emperors. They called it the Kaiser, uh, which is kind of evolved from the word Caesar. Uh, if you know about that, uh, the Russians have Tsar also as well, which is kind of similar to that. And so uh, this German Empire uh, will will have nicknames. I think some people later call it the Second Reich, Second Reich, or the German Reich. Uh, it was called, but. People call it either like uh, outside Germany, they call it Germany, and then, of course, the German people call it Deutschland, uh, of course, is the name that they common use, or the fatherland, I think, is also used uh, as well. So, yeah, those are the three uh, rulers that they had that were Kaisers. Uh, they all were also kings. They were king of Prussia and emperor of Germany uh, as well. Uh, they do think that the brainchild uh, of the German Empire uh, was Otto von Bismarck, who you see on the bottom left, who was one of the first chancellors of Germany. Uh, they called him the Iron Chancellor. Uh, and so he's the one that really was the brainchild uh, behind really how how Germany came about. I'll get to that later, not today, uh, but I'll talk more about, you know, how it became an empire uh, in the 19th century. Not really up to that time period yet. Uh, but... Um, yeah, uh, they do have the Franco-Prussian War. That was they they consider that war really to be the war uh, that really led to why you know uh, really Germany was able to unify because they were able to neutralize uh, really uh, the Second French Empire under Emperor Napoleon III, and so that was one of the things. And then the other thing that happened, they had that, and uh, also the um, they had this thing called the North German Confederation where Germany was able to unify all the northern German states into like one, one unified state. And so that led eventually to Germany being unified later in 1871 without Austria, which was, I think, one of the German questions that they had kind of asked about, like, who was going to create Germany? Was it going to be Prussia or Austria? And it ended up being Prussia uh, is, is the one, of course, that did it. Um. Now, if you study about uh, the different rulers, uh, the one on the left uh, is Wilhelm I. Uh, he was, of course, uh, the second son of Frederick William the William the um, Third. Uh, by the way, uh, there were two sons he had: uh, Frederick William the Fourth, and then Wilhelm the First. And uh, yeah, so he was the first emperor of Germany, or first Kaiser, who reigned from 1871 uh, to 1888. And so Otto von Bismarck, I think, was one of his first chancellors uh, that he made uh, chancellor of Germany uh, at the time. So that's him on the left. Uh, after the Franco-Prussian War, if you know about it, uh, the German Empire was actually proclaimed uh, at Versailles, Palace of Versailles in, in France. After they defeated France in the Franco-Prussian War. So that's, they think, when really the whole German Empire uh, is formed at that point. 
Uh, later they have, and of course you can see a map showing you like eventually after Germany does form into this, you know, empire, uh, you can see all the territories that they control. So her territory stretched all the way to France and Belgium uh, and the Netherlands in the west. Uh, you can see down Austria there, east towards Russia. And most of the northern part, especially like, you know, around Berlin and going east, a lot of that was what they called Prussia originally, that purple areas, I guess, uh, that are there. Now, I am related to people that are actually German, like Prussian, I guess. Uh, they were from like the western part, western part of Germany originally. But yeah, they have other rulers. Uh, they did have Frederick III, uh, who was a son of Wilhelm I. Uh, he, he briefly reigned uh, for about three months or less than 100 days, uh, but he died of cancer of the larynx. And so um, he didn't really stay on the throne very long, but, uh, but some Germans do talk about 1888 being the so-called year of the three emperors uh, in Germany, because uh, you actually had three emperors at one point in that year. Uh, then on the far right, uh, you've got Wilhelm II, uh, who was the son of Frederick III. He's the last ruler, last monarch of Germany uh, that you have, and the third Kaiser, of course, of Germany. Uh, if you know about him, he's the one that's famous for, well, he fired Bismarck, I think it was one thing he did famous, I know, in 1890, but he's known for, of course, being the, the main German ruler during World War I. Uh, that you have Wilhelm II, it's interesting about Wilhelm, by the way. Wilhelm, of course, was actually a uh, actually a grandson of Queen Victoria, uh, along with you know the ruler of I think the rulers of at the time. You know, you got um, Queen Victoria had like Nicholas II in Russia was a grandson. Uh, King George V in in, in Britain uh, was was her grandson, and then he had also uh, as well, uh, of course, Wilhelm II in Germany. Interesting thing, of course, about that. Uh, afterwards, uh, uh, Wilhelm will reign until 1918. I'll kind of go back to him uh, real quick here, but um, he'll reign until 1918. Uh, after uh, the Germans lost World War I, he went in, he, he actually fled. He abdicated his throne, fled to Holland or the Netherlands. And so after that, the, the Germans didn't have any monarchs after that. And so Germany became a republic afterwards. You have like the Weimar Republic follows next from 1918 to 1933. Third Reich, we'll get to that later. Hitler, of course, forms Nazi Germany, 1933 to 1945. And then if you know about it after World War II, uh, Germany was divided. West Germany, East Germany uh, during the Cold War era. Uh, even Berlin was divided, if you know about that, into East Berlin uh, and West Berlin. Uh, and today, today now, you've got the, the Federal Republic of Germany, which really, after Germany reunified in 1990, that's the state they got now, uh, which includes 16, you know, constituent states uh, that are part of it. But Germany is ruled by, you know, a chancellor. Uh, if you know about that, of course, the chancellor is the head of the government. Uh, they do have a president as well. Uh, which is the head of the state, more of a ceremonial position. But I know that the main chancellor today is now Olaf Scholz. He's the new ruler of Germany, uh, who just replaced, by the way, Angela Merkel, who stepped down last year, uh, 2021. She had been uh, she had been the ruler of the chancellor of Germany uh, going back to 2005, 16 years in a row at one point. So she was a pretty powerful ruler, Merkel, uh, if you know about her. So... Anyway, just a little history, of course, about you know later Germany. We'll we'll get when we get more into like the 19th, 20th century, I'll get more into what ha happens, uh, you know, the German state and all that. But Prussia is like you know the prototype state, really, that really leads to, of course, what we call now Germany, of course, today. Uh, before I go, uh, yeah, let me just mention a few things, of course, about you know assignments overall. Uh, don't forget. Uh, I think those are your main assignments out this week. I know the expiration quiz, conquistadors quiz uh, as well. And then you got the first vocab due by Friday uh, as well. So just want to give you a heads up on that. And don't forget our first exam, of course, is going to be you know posted also um, this week, probably Wednesday, which will be on the age of absolutism, which I'll send out announcements you know, about that. And, of course, it has directions with that. Uh, you'll, of course, you'll see later uh, overall. So, that's it for today. Uh, 
course, uh, tomorrow I'll have another live lecture. I'll have a course on the rise of Russia. So I'll kind of talk about the background of Russia, which really goes back to the Middle Ages, where Russia starts. Uh, but I'll talk about the rise of the Romanov dynasty mostly, and I'll get into some monarchs you may have heard of, like Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, of course, that are well known uh, still today. So that's it for today. Uh, yeah, the first exam is going to open probably Wednesday, probably right after my lecture. So, so that's it for today. So y'all, y'all take care. And I'll see you. If you have a question about this lecture or comment about something, uh, please let me know. So y'all take care and have a great rest of the week.